Oh man, here they come again. Here they come again. This still has skin on the skull. The owls that people are seeing, big, small, uh, have you noticed any kind of uh, synchronicities with certain stories? Uh, like, you know, this person over here said they saw a four foot owl and then this happened. And this person said the same thing and then something similar happened. And have you have you noticed a, a, like the, the, the situation with the owl experience towards an experience? Uh, any kind of synchronicities with that? So, so, so there's the real owl events. And then there's the four foot tall owl events. So the four foot tall owl events sort of fall into the, to the category of screen memory. The real owl events, wow, those are tough. I mean, you can, once you wrap your mind around the fact, well, okay, someone saw a four foot tall owl, they're in this lonely road, they're probably a missing time event, uh, you know, it fits over here. The, the, the real owls showing up at the time of a, oh, here, let me back up a little bit. There are five things. One of them is UFO contact or UFO events. Owls are most certainly seen around the time of UFO events. Not 100%. Just because you have a UFO event doesn't mean you're seeing an owl. Just because you have an owl sighting doesn't mean you're going to have a UFO sighting. There's like, but there's a, there's a consistency. Wow, there's a consistency enough to make a pattern. That was the, that was the premise of my first books, but I, there's more. So, so the other ones would be owls and meditation. People meditating. I got a lot of stories about people meditating and seeing owls. Owls and shamanic initiation. This is well understood in the community of shamans, which exists. There's practicing shamans. There's a, there's a, there's a mentorship process that takes place, but people going through the shamanic initiation will see owls very consistent. Owls and psychedelics, most particularly mushrooms, people will see owls and often in a, like a ritual kind of mushroom experience where they're taking it as a as a sort of spiritual thing i got a lot of stories of that and then lesser other other psychedelics and then owls and death wow if there's one thing that if i was going to write a book about something else i would write well that's i should be careful what i say but owls and death would be the big one where and this is well understood by people doing death research that owls show up at the time of of death. Now, what the lore is, what the mythology is, is that owls, like the hooting of the owl, will will be a will be a precursor, will be will foreshadow someone's death. This shows up in Shakespeare. It shows up in movies all the time. It's right there. It's in our folklore. That's not what I'm finding. I get some reports like that, but that's the majority of the reports I'm getting are where where someone's parent, it's usually a parent or a loved one, will die, and shortly thereafter an owl will arrive at their home and they'll talk to this owl or, the, or near, and they'll talk to this owl as if it is their dead parent. And I have many stories where the, the grieving process will be eliminated as they talk to a, to a physical, like a regular owl lands in a branch in the backyard. They go out and talk to it and their, their, their grieving is eliminated. I have a story of a guy whose father died of a heart attack. He's leaving the hospital. He walks out the, the doors, the automatic doors open. Middle of the night, he spent the whole afternoon day at the hospital. He's leaving in the middle of the night after his father died of a massive heart attack. He's on the, little, he's on the sidewalk and right on the grass next to the sidewalk. He's all alone. Middle of the night is a little owl. And he walks up to this owl and the owl looks up at him. The owl doesn't fly away and he says, Dad, I love you. I'm honored that you could have been my father. It meant so much to me. I'll always treasure your role as my father. That, I have that story with such consistency. That alone, like, so the, so I, the owl has an ominous lore, but wow, this beautiful stories I've heard like that kind of just make, it's a much more nuanced totem than just the spooky owl in a haunted house movie mm -hmm. so your question was how do i separate or what patterns am i seeing so the pattern is that these five events uh owls and ufos owls and meditation owls and shamanic initiation owls and psychedelics owls and death i would call those 
highly charged human experience. So the owl is not connected necessarily with the UFO. It is connected with a high, it is a highly charged human experience. The owl is connected to a highly charged human experience of which UFO contact certainly is one of them. So if that's the pattern I'm seeing, that's what it's connected to. So that's what I'm much more interested in. There are outlying things that sort of show up, but wow, I, for instance, the near death experience feels like it should be on that list. I, I got no evidence. No, I've got no stories of out. There might be out there, but I just don't have them. And I have to have a handful of them before they turn into a pattern. And, um, here, a couple things. People who have UFO and owl expense. UFO owls, though that combination. When I talk to them, a couple things very common. They'll say, "Oh, I had a spiritual awakening just after this stuff," or "My life changed direction in a much more spiritual way." I could say that about my owl experience with Kristen. I mean, I was doing one thing; I, I transferred into another whole different career, and and I have a sort of spiritual bend to the way or mystical or whatever. The spiritual is a funny word. It's a tough one to pin down. But I certainly am open to that spiritual side of it. Now, the another thing that shows up, you know what Reiki is, Reiki therapy? Yes. Okay. People have UFO contact in in connection with an owl. I will I would say this is a it's like I, I haven't crunched the numbers. It's tough. But anecdotally 50% of the people who have owl and UFO experiences are Reiki healers. Hmm. Like, I'll tell you what, 50% of the normal population are not Reiki healers. So, so you ask, there's a weird one. Like, and if it's not Reiki directly, it's another form of very similar uh, energy healing that they'll be doing, a modality of energy healing. So, so this, is, this is very mysterious to me, that that... that that that's not a little blip in the in the statistics that's a big yeah. impressive number of yeah that's okay. that, that's huge that's a huge number um get outside of the number one on that list of five ufo uh the other four traditionally are easily viewed as uh spirit world interdimensional other realm trans transcending realms and now uh you know, it used to be considered crazy talk in the UFO world, but even the the government and these whistleblowers coming out are putting more. They they won't say it the way I say it, but they they, they say it in almost like their own code way. It's like we're telling you what's going on without actually saying it because we don't want you to <laughs> to hear it from us. Uh, but it seems like these UFOs have an interdimensional quality to them as well, and and the way they're talking about them just appearing. Uh, through even at, at times I've heard this happen a lot where it's like almost like a slit of light and this thing comes out of it. Uh, so with, with those five lists, I think the, the, we, can, we can comfortably say, given the, the definition of UFO that I just gave, uh, there is some kind of spirit realm, spirit, uh, other dimensional type aspect to this whole thing uh, that you're talking about. And if I remember correctly, and this might be way more than just the Native Americans, but I, I think the Native Americans, um, they they viewed owls as like messengers to go in and out of the spirit realm. Uh, is that is that is that correct, or is that maybe the wrong culture? Oh, that's that's so Native American is tough, right? Because it's like you know, there's tribes on the Atlantic coast, which are very different than tribes in the Pacific coast. There's tribes in the desert Southwest, which are very different from the tribes up in, in, in the Yukon. So, but the, the, so here, the consistent consistency, it's tough, right? Cause it, cause there's lots of mythology about owls. There's lots of mythology about deers. There's lots of mythology about, you know, sunrises. So, but, but the, the, the owl mythology the owl can see in the darkness. The owl can see in complete darkness, right? So ancient man would have known that the owl flies at night. Now, just a few generations ago, the night must have meant something totally different to humanity. Before the electric light bulb, the night had a powerful mystique to it that is sort of lost now that we we can generate our own light with electricity. But our mythologies rose out of that ancient 
lore. So the owl could fly in complete darkness, was completely comfortable flying in the forest at night. This is different than the eagle that flies in the bright sky, the bright empty sky during the day. The owl flies at night in the darkness. The and and that very quickly turned into, let's just say quickly, that within the, the lore, within the mythology is the owl travels to the land of the dead, travels to the land of the ancestors, travels to the land of the gods, travels to that other realm, and returns with a message. And so, in, in uh, Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, had a companion little owl. It's actually a little owl. So if she's seen with an owl, it's like a little seven-inch tall, six-inch tall owl, often on her wrist in, in artwork and in statues and such. So in the, that's where we get the owl as wise. The goddess of wisdom had a companion owl. Um, now, present day, the most popular series of books in the history of publication is Harry Potter. Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It is perfect. It's perfect. It's the owl as messenger. It's right there. It's not in some dusty book on a shelf in an in a old library. It's present day pop culture right now, owl as messenger. Not, not like often the, it's right there at the forefront of our pop culture. So the owl would be the intermediary between our realm and that other realm. And that is, that's the, all the things on that modality, including the UFO contact things, wherever the UFO occupants are from it ain't from here whether they're from another planet i'm open to that but let me tell you like how to say this i talk to people all the time who claim to have had direct ufo contact if you watch a late night documentary right or i'm, I'm kind of using you know, cable TV. If you stream a documentary on yeah. UFO content at noon on a Wednesday, uh, anytime you want, you watch it on your phone while you're waiting in the bank. Yes, yeah, so waiting in line at the bank. So if you if you watch the story that emerges, oh, the people are taken from their car at night and they're taken onto board a UFO and they're put on a table and creepy medical exams are being done. I've heard those stories. I the conversations I've had with people and they when they and they tell me that is essentially never. I mean, it's sometimes, it's like less than 1%. What I'm hearing is, I had a powerful UFO sighting, and, and then afterwards, I had mystical events, I had psychic events, I had, this is the one that's overwhelming, I had synchronicities, coincidences of such magnitude that it has forced me to rethink the fabric of reality. Wow, that is the consistent thread. It's not lying on a table in a flying saucer. So, so that's the thread I'm pulling on. Is that is that mystical thread? Part of it is I'm completely like this. Is my own research. I don't have to like I I, I want to be a I want to be a competent journalist in the way I give the information, but I am not subjective. I'm excuse me. I'm not objective. I'm com totally subjective. I am, I am doing this for completely selfish reasons. I had my own direct owl and UFO type experiences. I want an answer. I, I, I got a lot of questions. I've got some interesting data points. I have, I'm very shy to say that, like what answers I may or may not have. Yeah. And I think uh, as you've done this, uh, as long as you have been, you've come up with a lot of answers, but, uh, do you still feel like there's questions that you really don't have answered? Like you've had questions that over the years uh, have either answered, you have a pretty strong inkling that this is how you feel like this is going. And is there, has there been things over the years that have popped up that you're just like, I just don't have an answer to this yet. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. All the, uh, like six times a day when I open my email inbox. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, so, so uh, that, that, that was a little bit provocative. I guess. So, so here, let me just, I'll just, okay. Two stories. I'm going to tell two stories back to back. I get these funny stories. They arrive back to back, like they mirror each other. So this, this two stories, um, this guy, Bert Jansen, he's a Dutch researcher and he does cropsicle researcher research in in uh and has been for 
decades now in England. And he, this is going back in the 90s, he's walking through the fields, sun is setting, he's in the crop circle country. He's thinking like, I'm done. I've been doing this for a few summers now, researching the crop circle. Like, I'm done with it. Like, move on. Like, what am I going to learn? What am I going to learn? And then there's this orange orb that floats through the field. And he's standing there in the field and the sun is setting and this orange orb is floating in the field. It gets tiny, like the size of a ping pong ball and grows big to the size of a beach ball. And it floats around and it floats along the edge of the field and there's a shed there. And it goes behind the shed and he's kind of watching it go along and it kind of, and it, it goes behind the shed and it doesn't come out the other side. And he's like, could it be that the, did the, did the orange orb go in the shed? So he goes up to the shed door and it's locked. And he puts his ear to the door and he hears this awful noise. Here's this awful, horrible noise, this hiss, this grim, creepy hiss noise. And he's like, oh my word. So he goes around the back where, where, so, if he, so the back it would have, and then right at the height where the, where the orb would have been floating is a window and there's a broken, the glass is broken in the window. And he's like, did the, did the orb go in there? And he comes back, and, and so he can't get in, and he's, it's nighttime. So he comes back the next day, and he puts his ear to the to the door, and it hears that hiss. And so he, he says, okay, I'm, he breaks the door. I'm, this is like, I love this. He, he said, I broke the lock. <laughs> and he went in, and there was a ladder in a loft, and up there was, was where the window would have been. And he hears this hiss up in the loft. And he climbs the ladder and he peeks over the edge. And it's a family of barn owls. And they make an awful noise. It is like haunted house, creepy as it gets noise. Baby barn owls. Let's Google it. It's awful. So he looks, he's like, wait, I saw an orange orb. It led me to these, to these owls. Could it be that the owl and the orange orb are essentially the same thing? He said it. He said it clearly 25 years before I started, or 15 years before I started my research. So, another story. This woman, Maria, we- Maria Wheatley, she does crop circle research in more, more of um, ancient sites, ancient mystical sites in, the, in Europe, in the UK and such. And so she goes to ancient sites and does this research. Now, she was with a friend and they were going to go on a walk. And the sun is setting and they walk down this path and they park their car and they, they get in the car and they start walking down the path. And as soon as they get a little ways down the path, whoosh, an owl flies in front of them and crosses their path. And they both get the same, they both 100% feel the same thing. It's like, we're not allowed down this path. We can't cross that line. The owl crossed our path. We can't cross that line. So they turn around and they say, let's walk up to the top of this hill site. So they walk up to the hill site, which is called Oliver's Castle. And there's no castle there, but that's the name of the hill in England. It's right in crop circle country. And they're at the top of the hill and it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden off in the distance, what is that? And this orange orb starts floating towards them. And then it gets big and then it turns into the size of a giant, huge cigar. And then poof, it disappears. And they're like, they're freaked out. And they run back down and and Maria says, the guy was like, oh, he couldn't get his key in his car. He was shaking so bad. So they went to the pub, England. They go to the pub. And the guy says, I can read the mind. I can read everyone's mind. Like, I know what everyone's thinking. I know I can read everyone's mind in the pub. It, that lessened over time. Maria was doing tarot reading right after the event. She was continued to do tarot reading. Her ability to do tarot readings was like amplified enormously. So, so here are two separate things. Maria has an owl. That leads her to an orange orb, a, a UFO. Bert has an orange orb, a UFO that leads him to an owl. 